privilege to be here. Um, I, as Elizabeth says, I write a blog. Um, it's actually a very lonely kind of life writing a blog. You occasionally get a bit of feedback, but usually you don't get anything at all. So it's really good to have an audience for a change. Um, yeah, so the title of my papers is The Dunedin Lawyer's Seed of Dissent, um, A.R. Barclay, The Boer War, and the Socialist Origins of um, Archibald Baxter's Pacifism. Um, I'm going to explain the motivation for the talk on the first slide. Um, so the motivation basically comes from the very first page of Archibald Baxter's We Will Not Cease, um, very famous memoir. Um, the first paragraph opens, many years before the war of 1914 to 1918, I had reached the point of view that war, all war, was wrong, futile and destructive alike to victor and vanquished. My first step on that path was taken in my early manhood when I happened to listen to an address on and against war by a Dunedin lawyer, a brave and upright man whose voice was as of one crying in the wilderness. So unlikely did it seem that his point of view would ever be accepted by more than the very few. Um, Millicent Baxter, Archie's uh, wife, um, tells us a story in her memoirs that Archie originally intended as a young man to uh, enlist as a soldier to go and fight in the Boer War, but that he changed his mind when he heard this speech by this Dunedin lawyer. Um, and that's pretty much all the information that, that you can find about this mysterious Dunedin lawyer if you look at those original sources. Um, and the fact that it was a bit mysterious just led me to be curious about who the Dunedin lawyer was um, and what he said in his speech. Um, so that's sort of really the, the focus of my research. Um, the questions are who he was and, and what did he say that made such a big impression. Um, in my article I go into a lot more depth on Baxter himself um, and you can, you're can more than welcome to read that where I talk a lot about his pacifism and his the things that sort of went into his thinking. Um, but in this talk, I'm just going to focus very particularly on this Dunedin lawyer and that very somewhat obscure time period of the Boer War. Um, so the motivation is sort of twofold. Firstly, to give some context to Archibald Baxter and his very early uh, political beliefs that led him to take his pacifist stance. Um, but I also want to argue, I hopefully I can convince you, that even though this is an obscure episode in, in history that most people have forgotten about, that it is actually a kind of interesting snapshot of a moment of history that uh, helps us understand the origins of peace activism in New Zealand. Um, so I'm basically going to leave Baxter behind. I'll sort of come back to him in, in, in passing mention, but I'm going to sort of go backwards in time to the Boer War period at the turn of the last century. Um, and this fellow here, who's the subject of the talk, is um, Alfred Richard Barclay. Um, so who was he? He was a um, member of the Liberal Party, one of the, the, the party that was in power uh, in New Zealand for the sort of the last part of the 19th century. He entered Parliament as a member for Dunedin North in 1899, um, just as the Boer War started. He was a member of the Fabian Society, Fabian Socialist Society. Um, he was something of a... a Something of an intellectual, he, he wrote like political pamphlets on people like Karl Marx and his labour theory of value. He wrote another pamphlet on unemployment. He was a, um, a big critic of, a, of the sort of the more mainstream side of the Liberal Party. Very much he was on the sort of the, the radical left flank of the, of the Liberal Party. Um, for my purposes, the most important part about it is his speech, and the speech that I've located was a speech that he gave, uh, and actually in 1902, to the Hillside Railway Workshop workers um, opposing the Boer War. Um, it's this speech, I believe, that um, Baxter heard and which made him change his mind about en enlisting as a soldier. Um, and I'm going to sort of talk in somewhat more detail about the speech in, in, at the end of the talk. Um, and what I'm going to do before I get to the speech itself um, is to try and sketch a bit of an account of uh, Boer War opposition in New Zealand um, and actually how and why Barclay himself came to be an outspoken Boer War critic. Uh, 
Um, this was an unusual kind of stance to take at the time. And I think it's a really interesting story in itself how Barclay came to sort of have this anti-war perspective, which when, obviously then went on to influence Archibald Baxter. Um, so that's my next uh, mm. Because of limited time, um, I'm going to do like a one-minute outline of the Boer War. <laughs> it's not going to do any justice at all, but I'm going to give you the very basics of what the Boer War was all about. It happened between 1899 and 1902. It was part of what people now refer to as the scramble for Africa, where the major European powers were competing for land and resources in the African continent. Um, the, the motivation was basically gold, also diamonds, but I think gold was the really big one. Some of the biggest gold reserves in the entire globe were found in the Transvaal region where the Boer War took place. And uh, Britain wanted the gold and wanted the land, to sum it up. Um, the Boer War inspired massive and intense jingoistic uh, pro-war support, both in the United Kingdom and in New Zealand. Um, the, the support was, I would say, uh, challenged much more in the United Kingdom than what it was in New Zealand. So even though in the United Kingdom there was a huge sort of pro-war, jingoistic spirit to pro-empire and so on, um, there was also a, quite a large and diverse coalition of people who were severely opposed to the war, both liberal and socialist. Um, outstanding figures including people like Keir Hardy and... Uh, also, even sort of more moderate liberal politicians like um, uh, David, you know, I'm feeling the name, uh, I'm going to come back, I'm going to leave that because I've forgotten it. Anyway, the, 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 the opponents of the Boer War in the UK were not really matched in New Zealand. There was opposition in New Zealand, but it was very, very minor in comparison. Um, and I'm going to move over to that now, to the uh, New Zealand Boer War critics. Um, in New Zealand, the, the Boer War opposition was very, very limited, um, mainly because of lack of access to critical perspectives. The, the, uh, the domestic press was completely dominated by more conservative pro-war voices, and if you wanted to get a critical perspective, you would have to be reading, you know, for example, like a, a socialist magazine coming from the UK or something like that, um, or a critical news, uh, newspaper. Um, and most people didn't have that, so it was a, it was a, a, there wasn't really that much space for criticism. Um, in New Zealand, the, the Boer War opposition was massively overshadowed by a sense of empire, empire loyalty and the sense of greater British identity. Um, nevertheless, there were some notable critics. Um, one of them was Chief Hansard reporter Jay Grattan Gray. He ended up getting um, expelled from New Zealand. He lost his job, said and fired him, and he had to leave go overseas because of his outspoken views. Um, there are some, NCW means National Council of Women Feminists. These are actually perhaps the most outspoken critics of the Boer War. I'm actually going to go into them in a bit more detail in the next slide. There are also some, a, a handful of liberal uh, parliamentarians who opposed the initial vote and there were some Irish Catholics. I'm going to go into more detail on the feminists. Um, I'm going to go into more detail on the feminists because I think they had a big impact on um, Alfred Richard Barclay. And do, I think. Do you need the light on him? Uh, no, I'm fine. You're okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm going to go into more detail on the feminists because I think they influenced uh, uh, Alfred Richard Barclay and I think indirectly the kind of uh, values that I think influenced Archibald Baxter as well. Um, so I'm kind of going into an obscure little corner of history that is. You know, probably not many people know much about. So bear with me with the details a little bit, but I think the details are quite interesting. Um, so I'm going to go back to May 1900. May 1900 is just after the beginning of the Boer War. Um, huge amount of jingoistic pro-war sentiment in the public. Um, and the National Council of Women hold their annual conference here in Dunedin, May 1900. Um, and during the conference, one of them, this woman here, Wilhelmina Sheriff Bain, speaks out passionately against the war. Um, she argues that the British motives have much more to do with gold and diamonds than what they do have, to, have anything to do with justice. 
um, and she just totally denounces it, a long, passionate speech against it. Not all the feminists agree with her perspective, but some of them do. It gets reported in the press. Um, and what makes this more interesting is that just days after the conference, the British have one of their most major victories of the war uh, in the war, called what, what's called the Relief of Mafeking. Um, Mafeking was an a English settlement that was surrounded by Boer forces. And there's a, there's a huge sort of story about how that, that you know, the heroic English forces came along and liberated Mafeking. Massive patriotic um, celebrations everywhere in the UK and also in New Zealand here. There was like a half day holiday. So in light of that victory, the feminists coming out against the war were, were seen as absolute traitors. Um, the press denounced them. They were, um, I mean, I think it got close to them actually wanting to take legal action against them. It was, it was way more than just saying, I don't agree with your views. It was, it, they were really, really out to get them. Um, what also happens just around the same time is that the Dunedin Fabian Society hosts the National Council of Women Feminists for what they called a soiree, a musical sort of evening with um, speeches and so on. Um, Alfred Richard Barclay comes out and defends the feminists, not for their pro, uh, not for their anti-war views. He still hasn't really said anything about the war, and he still insists he's kind of patriotic. But he basically just de defends their right to free speech, and saying, you know, this, the, the attacks of the press are completely unwarranted. These women should have, be able to, dem you know, have their democratic right to to oppose war. That starts in. in led in turn for Barclay to become the subject of an attack. Um, massive numbers of uh, editors from the big newspapers attacked him viciously, accusing him of being so-called pro-Boa and, and unloyal and so on and so forth, even though he hadn't said anything at all against the Boer War at this point. Um, there's one example. Uh, he was a sort of a dignitary at the time, and there was a, a huge patriotic rally in Dunedin just after this Mafeking victory, and there, were, there was a massive, massive uh, sort of a patriotic victory speech celebration in the Agricultural Hall, and there were 3,000 people in the hall listening to the mayor and other dignitaries. Barclay was on the stage as, as, as like a, uh, a minister. Um, massive speeches and throughout the speeches there were these interruptions of um, people in the audience calling out Barclay, Barclay um, really really vicious, aggressive uh, jingoistic attacks even though he hadn't said anything against the war um, now I'm going to move on soon but I think that last point just uh, it does deserve more investigation and my kind of speculation on this um, speculation or, or sense here is that um, there's a book written by Jock Phillips called A Man's Country um, and he develops the idea that um, New Zealand at the time had what he calls a culture of colonial masculinity um, and, and it's it, Barclay in my opinion doesn't quite fit so Barclay is very much sort of on the side of being an educated urban liberal sort of figure, and, and him going to a Fabian soiree and speaking out in defence of the feminists just totally cuts against the, the sort of the values of that colonial masculinity, um, and he opens himself up as a target. I'm going to move on now to the speech, um, and just, just to sort of give some background to the, what's going on, um, oh, now why is that picture up there? Not quite up to the speech yet. Uh, so there's the interim period. So that's May 1900. The speech doesn't actually happen until uh, 1902, which is actually towards the end of the war. Um, he comes out publicly against the Boer War in about the middle of 1901. Um, the middle of 1901 is significant. Why? Because that's when uh, Emily Hobhouse releases her expose of um, concentration camps. Concentration camps were used in the Boer War to um, contain the women and children to prevent them helping the, the Boer soldiers who were fighting against the British. Um, Emily Hobhouse went there and sort of documented what was going on in these concentration camps. And this, this is one of the pictures that she took. It's a seven-year-old girl, um, obviously died 
um, basically because of malnutrition and extreme lack of sanitation, along with literally thousands of others. I think the, the death toll was something like 26,000 people. Absolutely hideous. Um, so that, that was one of the influences, I think, on Alfred Richard Barclay, just the incredible cost of war and the, the disgusting treatment um, meted out to people like this by the British. The other influence, I think, that's very clear is that of um, J.A. Hobson, who was an English journalist who travelled to South Africa during the war and developed a, kind of an economic critique of um, imperialism. Which I think was really important. Um, so I'm going to move on to the actual speech. Um, now, so we're kind of moving back up to 1902. So my, my basic idea is that Alfred Richard Barclay is a switched on guy. He's read these critical accounts. He's read people like Hobhouse, like J.A. Hobson. He's got a, a, a really solid critique of, of British motivations for the war. Um, when he speaks to the hillside workers in January 1902, as far as I know, it's the only public speech in New Zealand of its kind. I, I might be wrong about this because I haven't actually done the research, but I don't know if anyone else has either. But as far as I can gather, there was nothing else. Like, this was it. As far as, you know, if you think of like rallies, you know, public rallies against wars that, are, that go on now, you know, there's a whole lot of them. And as far as I know in the Bible, this was the only time someone came out in an actual public forum and spoke out against it. Um, so in, in this speech, his opposition is framed in explicitly anti-capitalist terms. He argues that the wars motivated to secure the profits of the gold mine owners and that the stated motives that, that uh, Britain put forward were, were pretext. They weren't true. Um, the speech itself is subjected to immense pressure. Um, it happens like on a Saturday afternoon after knockoff time. Uh, the foreman stops them from speaking in the actual workshops themselves and they have to sort of go across the road to a paddock. This, this photo here is what the Hillside Railway Workshop entrance looks like now. So if you can imagine what that looked like 100 years ago, it would probably look quite different. But I, I think essentially there was a huge building there the same. Opposite it now is like a whole lot of um, <coughs> like car sale yards and things like that. But I think according to what I can gather before, opposite it now, I mean, so opposite 100 years ago when this happened, there was just a paddock. And so he kind of moved out of the entrance and across to the paddock where he had all the workers sort of around him and he stood up and gave a speech. But before he could give a speech, um, there were several attempts to stop him, having, stop him speaking at all. The chairman attempted him to stop. Um, then you have a, another patriotic group of workers parade past with a big union jack and they drum up the uh, national anthem. They all sing God Save the Queen. <laughs> And, and then the chairman declares the meeting over because, you know, that's just, that's it, and we'll see you later. After that, about 60 of these workers stay behind to listen to Barclay um, speak. So it's a tiny event. Like, you know, it's literally one kind of rebel MP speaking to a handful of about 60 workers. It's been completely forgotten by history. It doesn't really have any sort of significance in itself. Uh, and, I, and what kind of follows, I'm going to try and argue that even if it doesn't have, like, uh, you know, massive significance in itself, that there's something interesting about it that we can still learn and reflect on. Um, one thing that connects up with Archibald Baxter, I think, in this example, is that it would have taken a huge amount of moral courage for Barclay to make a speech in the first place. And you sort of get the sense when you're reading about it or just of the opposition he was facing. And um, it's my guess, and it's hard to know because who knew what was going through the mind of Archibald Baxter when he was 20 years old listening to this uh, rebel MP in a paddock in South Dunedin. Um, but my guess is that the example of someone standing up against the tide of kind of popular opinion, pro-war opinion, um, because of his deeply held moral and political beliefs, this example in itself may have had a big influence on Baxter as a young man and, and may have inclined him to, to his pacifist stance later on during World War One. Um, I'm going to give a brief quote from the speech um, before I move on to conclude. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of the socialist sort of message there. So this is, um, Barclay quotes from a, a pamphlet that was given out by uh, British Labour leaders, including people like Keir Hardy, 
and this is the quote, it is a war waged by capitalists with the object of gra gaining greater profits. The cry which they raised about the Uitlander grievances, the arming of the Boers, a Dutch conspiracy, etc., were mere, pre were mere pretexts to deceive you. The enormous sums which they made out of their Rhodesian diamond mines emboldened them to become absolute masters of the Transvaal gold mines also. They have all along wanted war to double their profits by cheap forced native labour. That's the basic, that's the, sort of the argument in sum. I'm going to move on to conclude. Um, gee, how much time do I have? Am I kind of okay on time at the moment? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got five minutes. Five minutes, cool. Okay. So that's good. Okay, so significance. Um, obviously, the, 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 the first point that I argue in my paper is that this had a massive influence on Archibald Baxter. Um, it was a, a life-changing event for him that, that led him to uh, change his mind about going to the Boer War, number one, and then eventually to, to become one of the most famous conscientious objectors in New Zealand. Um, nevertheless, I think I've got to recognise here that this event, like I say, was a tiny microscopic blip on the historical radar. Um, the, to, to give you a little sense of proportion, you know, 60 people li li listening to uh, uh, Alfred Richard Barclay in 1902, uh, in comparison, when Richard John Seddon spoke at the farewell ceremony to the first New Zealand contingent leaving to fight in the Boer War, there were 40,000 people listening. So if you compare the numbers, 60 versus 40,000, this just does not compare. There's no, there's no way I can argue that. Nevertheless, um, I do want to argue that we can look at this minor episode from a kind of broader point of view and see its significance in terms of the values and ideas which it carries, even without the numbers. Um, so firstly, the sort of the humanitarian and feminist objections to war by people like Emily Hophouse, by people like the feminists who influenced Barclay. Um, and secondly, the sort of the, the socialist objection to war and the beginnings of anti-imperialism as put forward by people like Keir Hardy and J.A. Hobson, implicit again in, in Barclay's speech. And I think arguably these um, critical seeds began to bear fruit in the late 1960s, when Archibald Baxter's We Will Not Cease is republished in 1968. Obviously you have anti-Vietnam War protests which are absolutely gigantic. And, and the, the idea that we can criticise war as being about uh, imperialism of major powers sort of going into places where they don't belong it, is a, it becomes a powerful common idea and and this is where it started in New Zealand at least back in this tiny little speech that I've identified um, finally um, I wanted to compare although it's a very very I'm doing this in very broad brush strokes, but I think it's fairly justified we can compare the Boer War to the 2003 invasion of Iraq um, both wars were kind of major imperial powers going into a much smaller, less powerful part of the globe. Both wars were motivated by, uh, by resources. In the case of Iraq, it was oil. In the case of the Boer War, it was gold. Um, and both, war, both wars involved uh, fabricated justifications. Um, so obviously in 2003, the weapons of mass destruction in the time of the Boer War, the justification had to do with the rights of immigrants that they termed Uitlanders who were working in the gold mines. And it was claimed that they didn't, because they didn't have democratic rights, Britain was justified to come in and take over. That, and and it, was, it was trumped up. It was, you know, so it was a fabricated idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 2003, why is that significant? It's the biggest protest that the world's ever seen. If you look at it worldwide, if you look at the actual numbers... The number of protesters protesting the uh, Iraq 2003 war is the single biggest protest in human history. Um, and there is a direct line going back to this minuscule little gathering of 60 people that I've identified in the research. Um, yeah. So I hope I've convinced you of the significance of an obscure historical event. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. for your